Corner. Jumped in my corner. Hey, folks, welcome to the webinar. We got a lot of cool folks here. We got Rob, we got Neil, we got Curtis, we got me, Raleigh. Um, so, yeah, feel free. Uh, if you, this is your first webinar, definitely come and introduce yourself. Tell us where you're coming in from. There's a chat box down below that you can, uh, yeah, we, you can, we can see your answers. But this is great. These are always fun because people from all over the world, you know, Sweden, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, it's, it's, it's really a global audience here. So it's really fun to see where you guys are coming in from. Uh, so how about since you're just, Neil, you're in, what, I, what city are, are you nearest in Saudi Arabia right now? I'm in Jeddah. Jeddah, awesome. Jeddah is on the west coast. I've got the Red Sea is like 300 feet away from me. Um, Yep, pretty hot, pretty dry. We, <laughs> cool. We got a, we got ten millimeters of rainfall two nights ago. Oh wow! That's, uh, That's the first for that part of the world, isn't it? The flood, the ten millimeter flood, and Rob, Rob, and Curtis, you guys are all in, in. Are you both in? Curtis, you're in BC, or Cologne? Cologne. I'm in BC. Yeah, I'm in BC. Yeah. Rob's in Alberta. Nice. <laughs> And I'm coming in from <clears throat> Classic Berkeley with the PETA protest going on outside. <laughs> I love that. Classic B-Town. We All heard right, them sing earlier in the, in the run-up. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Well, yeah, I thought, I thought it was, uh, you know, like the school shooting protest, but then it was like, PETA, what are you guys doing out here? You should be on a factory farm somewhere, you know? I know, exactly. Yeah. We'll go and anyway. go salad and farm if they could. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so we got Tara coming from Pennsylvania. Awesome. Well, uh, let why don't we just get started, shall we? So I'm gonna introduce uh, what we're doing for SDMC. Neil's gonna introduce Rob, and then we got a great presentation from these guys. They got about 90 minutes of fantastic stuff on greenhouses, which is just gonna blow your mind. So without further ado, let's get started. So hey everybody, welcome back to Sustainable Design Masterclass. We're dedicating as much as we can to bring you some of the top regenerative system designers that we can find in the world. These are people who are um, educators, entrepreneurs, you know, farmers who have really cut their teeth by either living and dying by what they can do on their land and with their business. And these two guys, Curtis and Rob, really live by that creed. And that's why we're fascinated to bring them on. Uh, and before we get started, make sure to turn off your distractions, Facebook, cell phone, Instagram, Snapchat. If you got a stupid dog in the corner like I do doing stuff, you know, give him some food and tell him to shut up. But without further ado, Neil, why don't you introduce these guys? All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. If you're watching live and this is your first time, send us an email after and let us know how you found us. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Avis and Curtis Stone. Curtis is an author and a backyard farmer, although you call yourself the urban farmer. That's, that's the name of his book. Mm -hmm. um, we met each other, I think, five, six years ago at a conference and uh, hit it off really well. Curtis has been taken off since then, and I've been watching him. Uh, Rob first showed up on my radar. I read an article from you, Rob, on PRI's website, and it was a video of you planting a tree in a park surreptitiously. Um, and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. And But Rob runs Verge Permaculture in Canada. He's been uh, designing and teaching professionally for, are you coming up on a decade now, Rob? Yeah. It's, it's nearly a decade, so we've got some fantastic experience here. Um, and they're a great tag team because Curtis, the kind of farming he does is really appropriate for the sort of greenhouses that Rob designs and builds. And so I'm really excited to see what you guys bring. Um, welcome to all of you who are here with us, and let's get going. Thanks, guys. Why don't you kick it off, Curtis? Um, do you want, well, to, to present or just to, yeah, just introduce what do you yourself. want to do? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, let's take that tour of your greenhouse yeah. and talk about how you use it in your business and then we'll get into kind of okay, more. Okay, so let me, yeah. Okay, so let me just uh, share my screen again here. Uh, where did I do that? 
Uh, what was the thing rally that I had to do to share my screen? Okay, so there should be a, a kind of a screen button that's below the orange arrow, and that should allow you. Okay, so I have to go back to being the presenter then, I think, don't I? No. Oh, yeah, well, you should be the presenter right now. It says waiting to yeah. view your screen. You are the presenter, and then you just got to click. Okay. Uh, you click there share. There we go. Can you see it? Boom. Now, yeah. now we're good. Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah, so some of you guys might be familiar with me. I wrote the book, The Urban Farmer, and I run Green City Acres, which is almost a decade old now. I think this is our 10th year, maybe ninth year in production. And um, we have had this greenhouse that we're going we're gonna to talk to you about past the solar greenhouses today. And um, I'm just going to give you a, a little tour of what it's at right now. I actually just filmed this video yesterday. And I'm just going to play through it and pause it at certain points and explain certain things. But this greenhouse has been instrumental to our production because it's allowed us to keep our cash flow coming in during the winter, which is a dead time for most growers that are in the northern hemisphere. You know, if you're not in Texas, California, um, you know, some of the southern states like Arkansas or Tennessee or places like that, you're most likely going to really, really slow down your production in the winter. But this greenhouse has allowed us to just keep selling microgreens and really scale them. We actually sell more microgreens in the winter than we do in the main growing season. And our main growing season is, is basically April through the end of October. So this has allowed us to operate um, throughout all the winter, keep cash flow coming in. For, uh, for my farm specifically, it's it keeps one person employed full time year round. That's not me. I don't actually run the farm in the same way that I used to. I do a lot of other things now, um, but I own the farm. This is on my property. I live here. And so this thing has been awesome. And um, because, you know, Rob's going to speak to a lot of this stuff in detail, but I'll kind of give you a tour of what it looks like. So Right now, we've got a 50% shade cloth on there, um, and that's because, believe it or not, it's really hot where we live in the summer. We're in a high desert climate, and um, we get up to over even sometimes 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so like 40 degrees Celsius, which is extremely hot, and we get really long days, and so we have to actually suppress some of the sunlight for the, the main part of our growing season if we want to keep this thing operating. But the basic idea here is that this thing is orientated to the south, so it's facing straight to the south. There is a northern back wall, and it's a double stud wall. It's heavily insulated. This also has a climate battery, and, and Rob's going to speak to a lot about that stuff in detail. But um, so this greenhouse essentially holds and stores heat and allows us to keep it going in the winter with, with very little input. I mean, we still have to heat it at the coldest points of the winter, but it, it, the heater just kicks on for short periods of time and because the, the greenhouse itself holds so much heat. So um, as it looks right now, there's this 50% shade cloth that we just tacked up on, uh, on top of it. You'll also see that uh, I've got the poly opened up on the bottom. That's basically just to bring in cold air and then it vents out as, as warmer air on the top. So that's been really regulating the temperature with the, uh, the shade cloth. And that's a rain gutter in front of it that basically just diverts the water when it rains or snows. Um, but let me just hit play on this and just kind of take you take you through. So I'll actually walk you into the greenhouse. I know it's a bit choppy, but I'll um, I'll just pause it in, in certain spots and explain some things. So right off the bat, you can see the uh, the south glazing, the orientation um, to the south where the sun is, and we use a double poly on this greenhouse, so it's two layers of greenhouse poly, six mil greenhouse poly. One is an IRAD poly, which is, um, which is a moisture wicking or it wicks away moisture. And then the other one is just a standard greenhouse poly. And then we have a blower that's a little fan that just blows air between the layers to keep them apart. But we don't actually need to, to run that in, in the summertime because it's more or less redundant. We don't need that insulation layer in the summertime. So that's why at the beginning you could see the, the plastic was it looked kind of deflated. Um, but we'll turn that back on in the fall. So in our greenhouse, all of the production happens, so you can see here, all the production happens on the left side, which is facing the south, as far as the growing, and then all of our post-harvest and packing and everything 
happens on the back wall and that stuff's in the shade. So it's, it's designed um, as almost like a, you know, an all included farm where we can grow, pack, wash, cold storage and all that happens in this greenhouse in the winter. We actually move our, a lot of our post-harvest infrastructure outside behind the greenhouse. And I'll show you that when we go around. Um, so a lot of that stuff isn't in the greenhouse right now. And it's actually, at this time of the year, there's less in here than there would be in the winter. In the winter time, the thing is packed. Every shelf has got something on it. We verticalize it. But in the summer, things grow really quickly. So in the winter time, our production cycles might be two weeks from seed to crop, seed to harvest. But in the summertime, like now, it's like eight days, some crops even six days. So there's not as much on the shelves because they cycle so much quicker. But uh, this greenhouse makes us a lot of money. You know, this thing paid itself off for me in about a year because it cost about 30 grand to build this. But if I were to do this again, using the information Rob has put together, I could probably build this thing at a third, or at least half the cost that I um, spent because I just did a lot of the wrong things. I had an engineer who um, over-engineered everything. And uh, with, with, with what Rob's put together, you, you're not going to run into those problems. So it's a, it a big trial and error thing. Um, so this greenhouse is somewhat over-engineered. And, and, and the and the drawings that Rob has are, are a lot more updated. Uh, we, we've collaborated on those designs and he's basically taken this greenhouse and made an updated version that's better, uses more appropriate materials and, and, and essentially costs less as, as, as far as the materials go. So yeah, you can see all the production here. Um, basically in this greenhouse, the production happens back here. And as the sun goes higher in the sky, which happens for anybody in the Northern or Southern hemisphere, when you approach your summer solstice, there becomes more shade on the back, which is actually a good thing. So we have some crops that can actually grow in shade back there, that, that third row back there. And then these rows up here are still getting sunlight. And then we have shelving up there too that uh, we, we can use. But like I said, we have less production in the summer because things grow faster and the demand goes down a little bit as well. These are some uh, sunflower shoots and pea shoots. These are radish and cabbage right up front here. There's some radish right there. Uh, we've also got this new technology in this greenhouse that's really cool. I know somebody might ask, so I'll just mention it. We're using these mats. They're called water pulse mats. And so we have a totally automated irrigation system in here that bottom waters. So that's been really great. It takes the pressure off in the summertime to go in there and water all the time because it just fills up. These mats fill like um, it's like a sponge material. And then they just wick into the bottom of the flat. So the flats kind of water themselves. They, they pull the water that they need opposed to you pushing it under with a filling table or watering over top. So it's kind of cool. It's really regulated our, um, our crop production because we don't have to worry about watering and, and they just take the water that they need. So there's, a, there's an up close shot of those mats. This is our planting area in the greenhouse. So we do all the planting of flats here. Uh, above that table, we've got our materials for um, you know, our flats and all of our nursery stuff that we use. Behind there, we've got all of our seed storage and big totes or in big um, bins, like all of our commodity seed, I call it. it. We've got our pea shoots and radish shoots and stuff all in there. And then we've got little seeds. So there's some of that stuff. And then all these little containers are, are smaller dry seed varieties and all that. So essentially, I don't know how long you want me to go on this about this, Rob, but essentially what you're looking at here is a microgreens operation in a greenhouse that easily produces about $1,000 a week, but we could scale it far above and beyond that. It just really just comes down to marketing. This is where we germinate our, uh, our microgreen flats after they're planted. So they germinate, they get covered, they pop up, and then, then we put them in the light, and then they grow another four or five days in the light, and then we harvest them. It's a really quick turnover especially in the summertime like this, like this thing grows so fast. Um, but you know, this is the basic infrastructure of our greenhouse. We've got all these self-watering mats in here now. And like I said, most of our post, all of our post harvest infrastructure comes inside the greenhouse. Once we get to late October, early November, when it just becomes uncomfortable to do it outside, we don't want to be getting wet when it's cold outside because there is quite, there's a, there is wet work involved here. We wash our greens, in a, in a bubbler, they go into a spinner. I'll show you that stuff as we go outside. Um, so, you know, we just convert that to outside when it becomes uh, nicer to be outside.
that's a washing table. This empty space here is where our bubbler and spinners normally go, but now they're outside. And then this is a drying screen where we dry the greens that we wash. And our walk-in cooler actually normally goes right here. And you can actually see, since, since we're at this little image, you can see this thing here, this pipe looking thing on the wall is the uh, climate battery fan. So at the foundation of the greenhouse, about three feet under the, the floor, there are, there's big O piping that grids the whole bottom of the greenhouse about a foot apart each one. And so there's all these pipes and there's an outtake on the opposite corner, kitty corner from this one. So this one pumps hot air underground and that hot air, you know, absorbs into the ground and stores in the ground. It also pulls out humidity, which is cool because it, it, it effectively works as a dehumidifier as well, which is important in a greenhouse like this. And then that air comes back out in the opposite corner. So you kind of have a twofold uh, solution with a climate battery. One is you store hot air underground when it's warm. And the other is you pull hot air out when it's cool. And so this is all connected to a thermostat and it does it automatically. So it just, if the temperature drops beyond a certain point, the climate battery kicks on and, and puts air that's warm underneath the ground. And when the temperature drops to a certain point, the climate battery kicks on again and dumps hot air underground, soaring it in that thermal mass. And it actually becomes like a, it's a battery, uh, a battery of heat. And so the floor in the greenhouse is always kind of, is always warm, which is cool. It really adds a lot to the, um, the temperature in it. And what ends up happening as a result is that you have a very stable temperature in the greenhouse. Like there's not there. Of course, there's fluctuations, but there's there's they're, they're way less radical than you would experience in, say, like just a polytunnel. If you just had a normal polytunnel in the summer, that thing can get go to 50 Celsius or 115 degrees Fahrenheit very quickly. And it can go below freezing. It can go down to like 20 Fahrenheit, you know, minus five Celsius really quickly in the winter. So the climate battery idea is that you're basically bringing your extreme up to a medium point, and then that gives you a lot more um, stability in your production. And so then you might supplement with uh, cooling or heating inputs as well to, to, to make it a lot more stable. And so those inputs for us, I actually didn't show it in this, uh, but right above here, actually, if I just go back to the beginning, you can see that's a, that on the top there, that's a, an exhaust fan. And on the opposite end of the greenhouse, there's an intake. And next to that intake, we also have a six kilowatt heater, which is connected to all the same thermostat. So heater kicks on, like first the climate battery will kick on. And if it gets, if it's, if it's getting too cold, like say it's minus 20 Celsius, which is like maybe around zero or something like that Fahrenheit, it will start, uh, the, 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 the climate battery kicks on first. If it gets too cold, then the heat kicks on. And the same thing here is if it starts to get hot, the climate battery will kick on first, start dumping that heat underground, which will actually effectively cool the greenhouse a little bit. And then if it gets hotter above that, there's two thermostats here. Th then the second thermostat comes on, kicks on the exhaust fan, pulls in cold air from the intake, and also is pulling air from the bottom where I, um, where you can see where I opened up the poly on the bottom. So in Rob's design, he's actually factored these things in now. It's like, we should have put vents on the front of our greenhouse at the beginning uh, but that was an oversight on our part so that's kind of why rob's designs are, are so valuable so i'm just going to walk i'm going to skip ahead here so now we're walking outside of the greenhouse and our whole all of our post-harvest infrastructure for the main season is on the outside on the north side of the greenhouse and so this is where all of our post-harvest stuff happens we've got uh, this is a washing table we had a similar one inside this one's a bit more scaled up and a bit more heavy duty uh, this is a bubbler over here. That bin is where we wash our greens. That white thing in it is a big manifold with holes in it that we force air through and it creates a jacuzzi type effect. So when we wash greens, it agitates them and shakes off the dirt, basically. And um, yeah, so coming in here, there's our washing table, there's the bubbler, it's kind of just taken apart. And then these are over to the right here, are, these are our salad spinners. So we have two, they're modified washing machines with a, a receptacle, like a food grade receptacle in there. And then those spin the, that spins the water off. And then we've got our drying screen here. And we've just done a bunch of dishes. You know, our flats are basically our version of dishes here on the farm. And so we wash those on the table and then they dry on the screen. But this is the screen we normally just dry 
our microgreens on or our actually we only wash our sunflower shoots actually but we use all the stuff for all of the other field greens that we grow on the farm and uh these are our walk-in coolers the silver one is the one that goes inside of our greenhouse in the winter months so basically the other six months of the year and then we use both of them when we're in full production mode like we are now uh, on the farm with field production and all that so those some walk-in coolers and then this is our packing area this is where we do all of our just like packing of bags of greens and um, stuff like that we have a little invoicing station there a little little computer goes there we this is a label printer um, so all that stuff isn't so pertinent to the greenhouses, but that's the basics of the infrastructure that we're using here on the farm to grow microgreens uh, year round. And uh, maybe I'll leave it at that. And if Rob wants to chime in with anything, I'll, I'll let him do that. Yeah, no, it's uh, amazing, Curtis. Thanks for sharing that. I think it really helps to, uh, you know, uh, make this a reality for people in their mind in terms of what a passive solar greenhouse uh, can be. And I think the big insight that I had before we kind of get into more of the detailed design portions uh that i've had just watching you use this space is that you can you can make really great a really great income from it um and you know we kind of get a couple of different types of clients coming through our um consulting process where we're uh helping homesteaders to basically create food resilience but um you can use something like this to help cash flow it initially and then you've got this additional level of resilience if that's something that um, that you want. So before I get too much into the details here, guys, my name is Rob Avis. I run Verge Permaculture here in Calgary. Um, we teach permaculture education amongst a bunch of other courses as well. Uh, one of the things that we specialize in is passive solar greenhouses, which is what you're here for today. We also have a consulting company uh, where we do most of our engineering work. So both my wife and I are professional engineers here in Canada, and uh, we design resilient homes, acreages, and farms. And given that we live in a cold climate, uh, in a cold context, um, you know, with a growing season as short as 100 days, um, now Curtis's is much longer than mine, but uh, you know, we, we have a much shorter growing season, we have cold nights, um, we, uh, we have, I think National Geographic called our bioregion the worst hail belt in the world. Um, so pretty much every year, our crops get destroyed, um, whether it's through early frost, through hail, um, or uh, you know a variety of other reasons. And so uh, originally, I cut my teeth in the oil and gas industry, um, building pipelines and oil and gas facilities, I then transitioned into designing passive houses uh, with a company here in Calgary. And then um, through the work with that passive house company, um, they asked me to design a greenhouse for them. And that was my kind of foray into passive solar greenhouses. And I used a lot of the ideas in passive house design in uh, the design of my first greenhouse, which is why my first greenhouse is full of mistakes, uh, which I'm very grateful for, actually, because I think making mistakes is one of the best ways to learn. And so for the last decade, we've been playing around with this greenhouse and working with, with its mistakes and re repairing the mistakes and kind of modifying it, um, as well as designing other greenhouses for other folks. We've also been involved in a large scale passive solar greenhouse in Invermere, BC for about a half a decade, uh, which is close to 3000 square feet. Um, it doesn't ever go below zero, it requires no fossil fuel inputs um, and could easily be transitioned into a commercial operation very similar to Curtis's. Um, it could be used uh, in Canada. We're looking at all sorts of uh, grow up opportunities up here. And so we're getting a lot of phone calls from people wanting to um, have uh, low uh, energy use, medicinal marijuana type operations. Um, and so we've been involved in the large and in the small um, and everything in between. And through all of those experiences, um, we've actually kind of put together a process. And so today, what I want to do is I want to take you through um, our passive solar greenhouse design process. And the reason that this is important is, and, and this is kind of a, a um, an outcome of the... Um, the abundance economy that we're moving into. And so what um, I've been observing over the years is that as we um, evolve the internet, information is, or, or I should say this a little differently, lack of information is not a problem that we really face anymore. Um, the internet has made information so prolific that um, the big challenge that we all have now is differentiating signal and noise. And so this presentation is an attempt at trying to get straight to the signal for you guys. So what I've noticed with passive solar greenhouse design is that when you follow a step-by-step -step process, um, you can fill the gaps in uh, with knowledge that you can go out and seek on your own 
um, if you've got the process. But if you lack the process, you may put the wrong pieces of information in at the wrong time and it may create what we call type one errors, which are errors that are difficult to come back from. So today I wanna to take you through the 10 step process that we use when we work with our clients. It's also the 10 step process that we use in our Passive Solar Greenhouse Design course. Um, and so if you just get a pen and paper and uh, make a few notes as we're going through, I think we're also gonna be sending this video out to you guys afterwards if you're signed up for the webinar so you can watch it again afterwards. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Before I do that, though, I just want to make a comment. Um, I'd love to know where you're calling in from, um, and I'd like to know one thing that you want to get as a result of today's uh, presentation. So if you can put that up into the chat window, um, I'd love to see that, and we'll get right into the content. Did you want to say something, Raleigh, before I, I get going on this? Yeah, as, as a quick uh, heads up to folks who are new to this, basically... Uh, if you have questions, please wait till when we have a question and answer part of this, because I know some of you might have burning questions and you really want to get answered, but we've also got a presentation we got to get through. So wait for those and yeah, just enter your uh, where you're coming in from in the chat box below. All right, thanks, Rob. Bye. Um, all right, so I'll. Uh, one Rob. one more thing, Rob. Yeah. Uh, Curtis, if you don't want everyone looking at your face, you can click on the little camera and microphone under that orange yeah. arrow. Yeah. There we go. And now it's just Rob. Hey, Rally, uh, or can you guys see my uh, my presentation there? Uh, not yet. It doesn't look like it. Uh, let me make sure that you're the right presenter. Okay. Okay, you're the presenter, but sometimes when you do full screen, it 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 shuts it out. So there, there we, we go. Are. Now I can see it. So everybody, everybody, if you can see it, just let me know. Give me some ones in the chat box. Patricia, right, you say yes, you can see it. Uh, yeah, everybody else, let me know if you can see it. I'm waiting for one more yes, then we can get going. Until then, you're all held hostage by me. <laughs> okay. Okay, Katie can see it. Dana can see it. Gabby can see it. All right, we're good to go. You're, you're all set, Rob. Awesome. All right. And, and if you want to learn so all the 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 things that people said, look in the, the questions panel and then you'll see folks uh, answers for that. OK, awesome. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right, folks. So uh, after thinking about this for a really long time, I'm going to go through this 10 step process with you guys. And um, uh, so what we've noticed is that most gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers in cold climates are depressed by their harsh climate, short growing season, and long winters. We help gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers extend their growing season, make their income perennial, and enhance their harsh climate through the design of passive solar greenhouses. Um, so today we're going to talk about kind of greenhouse design steps, so the process that I just referred to, and these steps include setting goals, site selection, aspect ratio, shape, foundation and knee wall, ventilation criteria, um, glazing and light, insulation, thermal mass, and integrated design. Um, so we're really gonna get into that nitty gritty, uh, the nitty gritty components of design, the things that, um, that you need to know in order to succeed at this the first time around. And you'll notice on the uh, slide that I've got up right now, I've got our one of our most recent designs, uh, which is a passive solar greenhouse, commercial kitchen, and root cellar all combined. I'll hit that at the back end of the presentation um, and, and I'll talk about why I've connected these three elements together and how they buttress each other. I've also got uh, the um, revised design that Curtis and I have put together of his greenhouse, which kind of takes the best of what he's got there and adds a few additional components in to address some of the uh, concerns that he's had over the years, just to optimize it a little bit more. Um, and I will be talking about our passive solar greenhouse design tool. Um, which is essentially my uh, version of democratizing mechanical engineering for people that aren't mechanical engineers. So I'll talk a little bit about what that does and, and why it's important. Um, and I've written a small ebook on passive solar greenhouse design, which is what this presentation is really about. So the first thing to do when you set out to build a passive solar greenhouse, like most design, is you want to set goals. And the easiest way to think about these goals are going to be kind of functional goals, but also um, goals uh, that, that may not uh, be associated with what you might think you use you might use a passive solar greenhouse for so as an example you might uh, set goals for I really want to grow citrus or I really want to grow peaches or grapes um, or I want to do aquaculture or aquaponics um, year-round and so the minute you know 
a species that you're trying to go after, um, it will instantly uh, constrain the, the problem essentially. And so one of the things that we have to deal with with greenhouses is we have to understand kind of what our, our range of operation is essentially. So when we're working in a cold climate, the amount of heat that a greenhouse loses is relative to the indoor air temperature that you keep it at um, and, and the outdoor temperature, the outdoor extreme minimum temperature that it gets to in your ecosystem. So that's gonna give me uh, an engineer and you, I'm gonna give you the tools to uh, understand what that means here shortly, um, an understanding of how warm the greenhouse has to be. Now. Um, one of the other goals might be that you might make is like, well, I want to grow, uh, you know, uh, vegetables uh, for seasons. Um, and, and I get a lot of clients that are vegetarian or vegan for various reasons. Um, they live in a northern climate, and so they need to be able to uh, control the temperature and absorb an enormous amount of light in order to be able to provide a sustainable source of greens and veggies uh, year round. And so this is one way that they can do that. Um, but another thing that people don't think about very often with these spaces is that, the, is that it can be incredibly um, helpful in the sense that yes, they're getting you're getting good food out of it, but you can use it if you've got seasonal affective disorder. Um, you can set a, a hammock up in there. You can put a, a hot tub in there. You can put a sauna in there. There's lots of other activities that can go on inside of these greenhouses, which I think makes the initial uh, cost of them uh, much more worthwhile to know that you're going to be growing in there but also doing all sorts of other really fantastic things kind of taking away the edge on winter if you will and if you're um, from Canada you know that the winters here can be quite long uh, in fact our winter just ended about three weeks ago which sounds strange we kind of skipped spring and went straight into summer um, and so you know having a greenhouse in the winter can be a really um, pleasant thing so really getting clear on what the greenhouse has to do is going to help you to decide on the shape of the greenhouse how much insulation you need in the walls, what kind of glazing material to use. Um, and it's gonna let you drill down into those really important details that we tend to overlook because we find them too compl complex. But you'll see here shortly that there's a way that we can actually simplify those things down. And I'll give you some rules of thumb. So this looks like a boring spreadsheet, but it's actually a really simple little tool that I've built. Um, and so remember when I was talking about in the goal section that you want to know if you're going to be growing a fig or a, a lemon or an orange or an avocado or a fajoa or whatever. The minute you know what your um, kind of critical path species or limiting um, factor is going to be in terms of the, the least cold tolerant plant in your greenhouse, you can select the USDA zone that you're trying to mimic inside of the greenhouse. Now, that's a really important piece of information for you and for me because what it does is it instantly constrains what the minimum temperature is. And I used Fahrenheit because, um, believe it or not, even though Canada is a metric country, we still use Fahrenheit and BTUs in our heating um, design calculations. And so it just kind of works out if you live in the States anyways. So this gives me my minimum indoor air temperature that I can achieve. Um, and then from there, we can um, input what our extreme minimum temperature is outside, which we can look up from our local climate database. Um, once we know what our extreme minimum outdoor temperature is and our, our minimum temperature indoors, that gives us a lo a loads of information about what's, what type of R value to use, what type of glazing to use. Um, and so this information gets placed further down into the, into the spreadsheet. And literally what we do, once we know what these temperatures are, um, we can play around with different R values in the wall to figure out what's most optimal uh, for your greenhouse. Now, I should just state that the difference between a passive solar greenhouse and a standard greenhouse is that a standard greenhouse has glass on all sides. And these greenhouses are perfect for countries like Holland, where it's not that cold in the wintertime. You've got super overcast uh, you know, weather, really, really cloudy, diffuse light. Um, and they just don't really work when it gets cold and you do have you do have a bit of a sun resource in the wintertime. And so in Calgary here and a lot of Canada, we get fairly decent um, sun. And even in the, the Northern United States, we get you guys get fairly decent sun. Um, you do get to extreme temperatures. And so we don't necessarily wanna have glazing on all six sides. And so that's really what differentiates a passive solar greenhouse versus a regular greenhouse. So a passive has only one glazing surface typically on the south side, whereas a standard greenhouse is gonna have glazing on all six sides. Now, obviously if you're, creating a structure that's designed to harvest sunlight, 
I mean, basically all a, a greenhouse is, is a solar collector. It's basically a giant solar oven that we uh, design to stay at a certain temperature. Um, and we do that by uh, either uh, selecting the right site, um, choosing the right ventilation strategy, um, and, and making sure that we're getting enough air movement through the space. Uh, one of the most important things that you can do is get your site selection right. Now, it turns out that the optimal, write this one down, this is an important note, um, the, the most optimal orientation for a passive solar greenhouse in the northern hemisphere is 15 degrees off south towards the east, so 15 degrees to the southeast. And the reason for that is that it's coldest at night, uh, you know, just before the sun comes up, basically, which makes sense because if the sun's been down all night, then the atmosphere is going to be absolutely the coldest point in the diurnal cycle right before the sun comes up the next morning. And so your greenhouse is going to follow that similar trend. And so having your greenhouse slightly oriented to the southeast by about 15 degrees is going to give you access to that early morning sun um, and warm your greenhouse up earlier. And it will also help you to reject a little bit of the western sun, which is typically the hottest sun of the day or the, the, the time of day when your greenhouse is hottest. And you actually don't need any more thermal energy. Um, so it helps to reject some of the afternoon sun and absorb the, the much needed early morning sun. Um, having said that, you can design your greenhouse and succeed with it um, within 45 degrees, either to the east or to the west. Uh, and you will not see that much of a, a solar um, loss. So as on this slide, for example, and I've got a house in there instead of a greenhouse, but um, the house that's uh, 45 degrees off of south will still get 70% of the sun that a greenhouse gets when it's directly due south. So what I'm saying there is if you don't have an optimal site where you can be 15 degrees over to the east, um, or directly south, it's okay. You're still going to get a pretty good result as long as you're within 45 degrees of due south, if that makes sense. Now, the aspect ratio is also really important, and this is the footprint that the greenhouse actually operates with. So, a one to one aspect ratio um, would have a foundation or footprint of, um, in this case, I've got 10 by 10, so 10 feet by 10 feet. That's a really, really small space. I wouldn't recommend building a greenhouse that small, actually. Um, a, two, a one to two ratio would have a 10 foot. Uh, deep and 20 feet wide, um, a one to three, 10 feet deep by 30 feet wide. Um, really anything kind of one to one up is totally fine. Um, generally speaking though, the further you go north, the uh, the wider you want your greenhouse to be um, relative to how, how deep it is. And that's because what we're trying to do is optimize solar gain and minimize thermal loss essentially. And this these types of aspect ratios um, allow us to do that. So hopefully that, that makes sense uh, for you guys. Oh, one more thing I want to say on this slide. So um, I've got a solar pathfinder up here. This is a uh, solid state tool. I highly recommend it. It's great for all types of designers. I use it in my photovoltaic uh, designs. I use it in my passive solar greenhouses. I use it in my passive house designs. Um, I use it in my solar thermal designs. So anytime I'm trying to optimize sun or trying to optimize shade, in other words, trying to get more shade, um, I use a tool like this. Now, this tool is roughly uh, 300 US dollars, I believe, and you can get software that comes with it. Uh, it's another 200 bucks. It's an amazing tool. But if you don't want to spend that much money, another tool that I carry around with me all the time is on my smartphone. Um, see if I can pull it up here. And there's a version on um, Android as well as um, on iOS. Um, this one's called Sunseeker. I think this is available on both platforms. And it's about eight or 10 bucks. Um, and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what's going on uh, on the site. So you can use a $10 option and get a pretty good idea. If you're gonna do this professionally though, I recommend this tool. It's kind of middle of the line, never runs out of batteries. And uh, it um, it's pretty pretty accurate. So. Once you've got the footprint, then the next thing that we do is we create the cross section or the shape. And there's really a whole bunch of different types of shapes that you can use. Um, my greenhouse is on the bottom right hand corner when it was just in construction there, it looks a little different now. Um, and so you can see actually a bunch of mistakes um, that I made on that greenhouse. One of them is the overhang that I put in there, which is a, um, uh, a result of my passive house designing um, career essentially. I was trying to reduce the amount of sunlight coming in in the middle of summer to, to try and 
compensate for the overheating that will inevitably happen in these greenhouses. Almost every greenhouse will overheat uh, because you're absorbing so much sun. But the thing is, is that you the overheating is actually better than trying to cancel out the sun because you need the sun to grow. And that was just a result of me being uh, a young engineer with very little growing experience when I started doing this. And so I don't recommend putting on overhangs on your greenhouse like this. You're better off to take the overhang off and uh, accommodate uh, with more or compensate with more ventilation essentially. In the top image here, we've got our 3000 square foot greenhouse in Invermere, BC. We've got an uh, off-grid power system with uh, solar thermal up here as well, which injects hot water into the, the foundation. We've got um, a standard hoop house on the front here, which we just cut in half. And then we built a shed style roof on the back um, and we abutted the front of the greenhouse to the shed style roof. So that's essentially this shape right up here. And this is a really great shape for large scale greenhouses because all of this stuff is right off the shelf. We basically are buying um, prefabricated uh, ribs. Typically they can be pre-engineered so you can save a bunch of money. Um, and you've co comes with a glazing package as well. And so it's kind of all sorted out for you. Um, this is one of our new shapes. So this one is the commercial kitchen, root cellar and passive solar greenhouse right here. And then this is a really simple shed style roof, um, which is really, really simple to construct, really inexpensive and uh, super effective as well. Um, one of my colleagues has just built this house. This is still the house in construction, but he's actually created a passive solar greenhouse attached to a building. Uh, and so they can walk right outside their kitchen. There's, there's going to be a hot tub there. They've got all their microgreens production right there. Um, and so they've got year round food coming into the house, but then the house is also feeding back into the greenhouse. So the heat recovery ventilator is dumping uh, raw air back into the into the greenhouse. The dryer vent is is pumping um, hot waste air back into the greenhouse. The the vent from the bathroom and from the kitchen are both pumping into the greenhouse. So we've got an example of a system that's creating symbiosis with the building. And there's a lot of design that went into this building to make sure that we weren't going to have vapor issues um, in the walls and uh, you know creating mold and all that stuff. So it's not something you can just go and do um, without a little bit of um, you know pre-thought and design. Uh, but it is possible if you put enough effort into the design on the front end. So once you've got the footprint and you've got the aspect ratio or the, uh, I'm sorry, not the aspect ratio, the, um, the footprint plus the cross section of the greenhouse, um, you basically just extrude it out and that's your whole greenhouse system. So the next step that we have to do is talk about how we're actually going to support this greenhouse. And so there's several different foundations and I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this because um, if you're going to build a greenhouse, you're either going to be already an expert on foundations or you're going to be bringing somebody that will help you with foundations in. Um, and so needless to say, there are a ton of different foundation options. Um, what I will tell you though, this is kind of worth all the, all the beans for the, the entire show today. Um, don't go and build a concrete slab under your greenhouse unless you have a very specific reason for it. Um, your best bet is to act, either go with a deep foundation wall, frost wall, so it goes below the frost line, or what we call a, uh, a strip footing with a shallow insulated foundation around the outside. Um, and again, if you don't know much about foundations, you should go find a contractor that can help you. Let's talk about the principles of the foundation first. So number one, the principle of, of your foundation has to support the building. So it has to be strong enough to actually take the greenhouse load. Um, number two, and just as important as taking the load, is it has to keep the frost out of the inside of the greenhouse. And lastly, we want our foundation to be built in such a way that the plants get access to the subsoils um, that they are growing in. And this is really important. And it's one of the other mistakes that I made on my greenhouse, again, all those years ago. It's also a, a mistake that was made with the Invermere greenhouse. Um, so we built our greenhouse on top of a concrete slab because I didn't have the heart to rip the slab up um, because I didn't know if I'd be taking the greenhouse down in the future. And so I didn't want to have to uh, rip the concrete and then re-pour it down the road. Uh, and then in Vermeer, they poured a slab in order to make it accessible. But, you know, in retrospect, we could have uh, made certain parts of the greenhouse accessible and other parts um, still accessible, but not necessarily paving the whole surface. 
when you disconnect your plants from subsoils, um, you take away their most vital nutrients, which exist in the clays, sands, and silts. Uh, and so you're constantly having to remineralize your beds. And when you're growing in a greenhouse environment, these plants can get quite stressed because you're creating an artificial environment for them. So we wanna plant our greenhouses in the soil and we wanna do it in a way that allows us to plant our plants in the real soil as well. So essentially your foundation has to accommodate for your plants getting access to real soil. If you have any questions about that, just put them into the uh, question section and uh, we can address that towards the end. So the knee wall uh, sounds more complex than it is. Um, it's essentially just this front wall at the front um, and it accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, it's gonna push the whole glazing surface up. So you can see in this greenhouse, we've got a, an open web truss system and there's lots of different trusses you can use to support the glazing. Um, but principle number one with the knee wall is we wanna make sure that the, that the glazing system is high enough so that we're not gonna bang our heads. Another mistake that I made on my greenhouse, and every time I try and harvest on the front of my greenhouse, I smack my head on one of the, the trusses. Um, ergonomics is really important if you're gonna be inside of a building. And so we wanna make sure that this is tall enough so that we're not gonna, the tallest person using the greenhouse is not gonna bang their head. Number two, um, the snow will shed off of this greenhouse. So we wanna have a, enough room up here for the snow to accumulate. Um, and, uh, and then number three is that the knee wall can be um, increased or decreased in order to try and get a specific slope on your glazing surface. Now, it's really interesting because as we've moved towards um, polycarbonate um, for a glazing surface, the, um, the angle of glazing is less important than it used to be because what happens is light will actually hit the polycarbonate, it diffuses, and, uh, and so we don't have the same problems that we used to have when we used glass in our greenhouses. Um, and so now the angle of glazing is more dictated by snow load and less by uh, optimizing sun. And so your knee wall is gonna help you to, to get to your 412 or 612 uh, glazing angle, whatever you end up shooting for within your specific uh, climate. So ventilation is the mistake that I see happen most often. So this is also worth the entire uh, cost of today's uh, production. Uh, don't underventilate your greenhouse. You literally cannot overventilate your space. Um, the sun puts out roughly 800 watts per meter squared. So that's roughly, um, or we could say 800 watts per square yard. Um, that's roughly the same as eight incandescent light bulbs shining on one square yard of, of surface area. And if you wrap your head around how much energy that actually is, when you look at um, a greenhouse that has as much glazing area as, as this one, or this one, or this, this community greenhouse, I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of kilowatts uh, entering into this space every second. Uh, and you literally cannot uh, exhaust all of that energy fast enough. And so, it's really important that we have high vents, so vents that will allow the air to leave, the hottest air to leave. We have low vents, which allow the cool air to come in. We have cross vents, which allow passive air to move through the sides of the greenhouse. Um, and sometimes we can add additional cross ventilation in by putting in man doors or double man doors um, in strategic locations so that in the really hot parts of the summer, we can open things right up and get that really great cross ventilation. Only once we've exhausted, pardon the pun, uh, the ventilation options will we put on a, a, you know, a powered exhaust option. Um, and ultimately, we wanna try and make everything as much as passive as we possibly can before we start adding power into the system um, to move hot air out. And I will talk about thermal storage in a later slide here shortly. So as I mentioned, um, glazing is really important. So now we've got our aspect ratio, we've got our cross section, we've thought about our foundation, we've, we know that we're gonna plant our plants in the soil, um, we've set up our knee wall, and now we've gotta choose a glazing option. And so this is gonna be dictated by how much money you have, because glazing is probably one of the more expensive parts of the, um, the greenhouse. And if there's time at the end, um, we can talk a little bit about how Curtis has glazed his his greenhouse. It's really great, actually. He's used two layers of poly, which is about a 15th of the cost um, that it would have cost him to use polycarbonate. There are some pros and cons, and there are some bioregional specific uh, bits of information that you need to know about before you go to a double poly wall versus a polycarbonate wall. 
hail being one of them. So if you have golf ball size hail, like I do in my ecosystem, I couldn't get away with a double poly wall um, very effectively. But in Curtis's system, it's perfect. Um, and so the kind of high level things that you need to know about for the glazing of your greenhouse is you need to make sure that the, the glazing material gets 70% transmissivity. This is super critical. I've, I've consulted for people who have gone ahead and built sunrooms without our advice. And uh, they end up buying what's called low transmissivity polycarbonate only to find that their plants won't grow underneath it. Um, the reason they use low transmissivity, transmissivity polycarbonate is so that the spaces don't overheat. But as I said earlier, the, we're trying to photosynthesize. And so we need those photons to come through. And so we compensate for the overheating by putting more ventilation in. Um, generally speaking, polycarbonate will have an R value between one and two. I've seen them as high as three, but you're always fighting R value versus transmissivity. So as your R value goes up, your transmissivity generally goes down. So the critical factor is that you have at least 70% light coming through the glazing material. So there's basically three main poly polycarbonate manufacturers that you can check out. And most of these are in the States. So you've got Coex Corp. Polygal and AC Plastics. Um, those are the three main uh, manufacturers of this material. One more tip, um, this stuff is uh, kind of like a check valve and the sun can only go through it in one direction. And if you get it wrong, the polycarbonate will photodegrade um, and it will last two or three years and then it'll be over. So make sure you read the labels, read the, read the instructions, um, put it on the right side out. Don't make the mistake that I made. Uh, actually, I didn't make it. One of my uh, helpers made it and uh, ended up having to replace a bunch of polycarbonate because of it. Um, so light, um, we've got you know a whole bunch of different light levels. Generally speaking, we want to kind of stay above um, you know 2,000 foot candles. Um, the most commercial greenhouses are not going to use foot candles or lumens. They're actually going to use PAR, but I'm not going to get into that in this in this presentation because it gets a little bit too complex. Um, PAR is a very, I think it stands for photosynthetic active radiation. Um, it's a much better indicator of light levels and um, because, because light actually acts a little bit like, uh, it's got a, an intensity level, but it also has almost a similar characteristic to rain where it will actually accumulate. So they actually look at it th um, through the lens of accumulation as well. Uh, but generally speaking, if you want a really simple metric to see if your greenhouse has enough light, we're shooting for that kind of 2000 foot candles and up. Anything less than that and your plants are gonna get leggy. Um, this is why office plants tend to be, um, you know, um, subtropical plants that would typically be found in rainforests in the low canopy. We're not typically growing those types of plants to grow food. So we need to bring that light level up. Um, and so reasons that your light levels not, might not be up high enough is you've put an overhang on there or you've chosen the wrong type of glazing material. So really making sure you're getting enough light um, and also enough intensity of light is really, really important. And so if you follow the rules of thumb that I've given in terms of uh, making sure you're, you choose the right polycarbonate um, or the right type of greenhouse poly, you're gonna be fine. Um, one of the things that I did was I, I built a little light calculator. Um, so if you are going to grow um, food or some sort of a plant in a greenhouse using artificial light, it's really important that you quantify the amount of additional light that you're going to have to put in there. And so I created a, um, a tool that allowed me to choose from four or five different technologies. Um, and it was, it was for me, but also for other people that don't know much about artificial lighting. And so um, we put in LEDs. Um, CFLs, which are uh, compact fluorescents, um, high intensity discharge lights like sodium and metal halide, um, as well as T5 uh, fluorescents. And so each one of them has a metric inside of the calculator. So how many watts per square foot um, will, it'll put out, how many lumens it puts out. Um, and then you can also input the amount of uh, dollars and cents that you're gonna, you're gonna spend per kilowatt hour on power. So this allows you to really get uh, your business plan tight. So if you know that you have to um, spend money on lighting every year, you can quantify how much money you're gonna be spending in electricity to keep your greenhouse lit. This is one of the reasons I love Curtis Stone's model uh, is that he doesn't need a lot of artificial light to grow microgreens. And so he really uh, gets the benefit of that passive solar greenhouse without having to spend copious amounts of money on electricity 
um, to run artificial light. So if you're doing this as a business, um, even if you're just doing this for personal reasons, I would encourage you to try and find strategies that don't require artificial light first and only go back to this um, if you need to add artificial light into your system. So insulation is kind of like um, uh, foundations. There's an enormous amount of, of options out there. Uh, I've got hempcrete here. I've got uh, the Nexem um, kind of concrete wood blocks. I've got uh, insulated concrete forms, um, styrofoam panels. Um, I'm, I'd rather just, I think, talk about principles here as opposed to telling you, you know, you should go use a hempcrete or you should go use styrofoam. Greenhouses are really uh, humid environments. And so the, um, the trick here is to make sure that you're thinking about how vapor is going to be managed within the system. So if you're using uh, materials that are susceptible to mold, um, they're probably not appropriate for a passive solar greenhouse. Uh, unless you've really taken a lot of, uh, put a lot of thought into how that wall system is going to manage vapor. So we actually have a, a student of ours that built a straw bale greenhouse, which is the one on the top left-hand corner that you can see. Um, and the reason it works is because uh, the plasters that were chosen were very specifically chosen to manage um, vapor moving through the, the plaster layer. So there's never trapped vapor in those straw bales. So it can be done, but you do need to think carefully about how you're going to manage that. Um, so I don't have necessarily a preference for materials. I think you should do your research with regards to what's local, um, what you can get cost effectively. On the bottom, I'll just put my mouse over it here. Um, this was a, another student of mine that used old tree planting uh, trays and they turned them into ICF blocks. So, um, you know, like if you've got tree planting trays and you've got an innovative way of trying to uh, tie them together, you know, by all means, go in and do that. Um, there's lots of different ways to skin a cat and uh, by all means, you know, do your research. So just make sure that your uh, insulation can handle the vapor, that you've thought about how vapor is going to move through the system. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you're just getting started, um, what I recommend is that your wall system should never really go above um, an R value of 20, or at least start there. You can always um, add more R value down the road, and, and I'll explain a little bit why here in a second. Um, but um, an R20 is, is, a, is a really good place to start. It's kind of a conventional R number now for a conventional North American building in 2018. Um, and what I've noticed is that doing anything kind of beyond R20, uh, and, and, and that might even be high for your bioregion, it all depends on where you're growing. Uh, but anything beyond R20 is not really going to serve you because um, so much of the energy is leaving the glazing, essentially. So start with R20, and, uh, and, and I'll talk about right now how you are going to kind of, um, justify whether or not to go higher or lower. So to, to really get the design right on your passive solar greenhouse, you want to make sure that um, you're doing your, a little bit of math. And so I, I kind of broke this down into our design tool. Um, and what this does is it actually looks at all the different components that we've just talked about. So your footing and, 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 and slab, the roofs, the glazing, the walls. And just by putting in a couple simple numbers, you have to know how to calculate area and you need to, to select an R value. So if you can go to Home Depot and you can use a tape measure, you're good. Um, and what this does is this little tool will actually tell you where all your heat loss is coming from. Um, so it's got data visualization. And so as long as you can read a pie chart, which is what the, we're showing right here, what you can see is that most of the energy is leaving from the glazing. And with a little bit more deduction, what you'll realize is that most of that heat is being lost at night. So the next tip that's worth the entire cost of this webinar, which is free, but uh, uh, is that you want, you want to optimize your glazing and then you want to uh, put an insulated tarp on, on your glazing at night. Um, and you can literally half, uh, quarter to half your heat loss uh, on an annual basis with something as simple as a construction tarp that, that has insulation in the middle. Um, because most of your heat loss will happen at night when there's no sun in the middle of winter time, which can dramatically affect your cost of operation. And uh, you know construction tarps are cheap and they're easy to use. And so just coming up with an inexpensive, insulated curtain um, is a great way. So if you don't want to, to go to the 
premium glazing, you want to go to kind of a middle run glazing, that's fine. Um, then invest your time in design uh, by getting an insulated curtain on the front of the greenhouse and you'll cut your energy bill down dramatically. So thermal mass is really important. Um, you, you really can't over mass a greenhouse and there's def different strategies. So there are pros and cons to each one. We can use rock, we can use cob, um, we can use a subterranean heating and cooling system. Um, and basically the way that a subterranean heating and cooling system works is we have a small little fan. It kicks on at 21 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, puts a whole bunch of air underground um, that's warm and humid. It cools the air down, which then forces the air past its dew point, which then uh, releases its moisture. And when you release moisture out of air, you actually release heat as well. And that heat gets stored in the ground. Um, and then if the greenhouse ever drops below 12 degrees Celsius or about uh, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, the fan will kick on again um, and it'll, it'll pump that heat out of the ground, which it's stored during the day, back up into the greenhouse to keep it warm. So you're really you know, leveraging the, the water in the soil, the thermal mass of the soil, and you're taking that surplus thermal energy during the day and you're storing it underground. And if you calculate how much thermal mass you get access to by using a system like this relative to a cob bench, let's say like in my greenhouse or a rock wall, you know, it, it probably beats it by, by an order of magnitude at least and maybe even two because soil is just so heavy and can st store so much water. So I have a simple thermal mass calculator that I built as well, um, which will tell you approximately how much thermal mass if you're going to choose to use rock or water or some variant thereof. And there are some basic rules of thumb, but you probably don't need to use any thermal mass if you're going to use a subterranean heating and cooling system like Curtis has in his greenhouse, which he referred to as a climate battery. Um, so in order to design one of these uh, subterranean heating and cooling systems, um, they're a little bit complex and I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that I'm running out of time and I want to give you guys some time to ask questions. Um, but basically, the, the biggest mistake that I see here is that people um, miss size fans. So they don't size the right fans. So they're using more power than they should be using. Um, and they get the ducting work wrong. And so this is where the mechanical engineering kind of comes in. And um, I've always struggled to explain this to folks. And so again, being a nerd and uh, kind of pr proficient with, uh, with Excel, I created a subterranean heating and cooling um, design tool, which, which fits into my greenhouse design tool. And what it does is it optimizes airflow based on the number of ducts, the size of duct and the size of greenhouse. Now, there's, there's still not a lot of literature on these things, and I'd like to change that. Uh, it's one of my goals here in the next five years is to start um, creating some white papers around this and some general rules of thumb on how to design and optimize these systems. Because largely up until now, um, most of these systems have been built with DIY uh, motivations. And, uh, you know, I can do all the thermal dynamic modeling on this, but the cost of it usually outstrips the cost of just putting a system in. So it's cheaper to put the system in than it is to hire me to thermal dynamically optimize it. And, uh, and so the way that I get around not optimizing it is that my recommendation for folks is that you, you design this system with a variable speed fan so that you, after it's installed, you can change the parameters on the system so you can speed the fan up or slow it down uh, to find that optimal point. So instead of spending the money on an engineer to thermodynamically model it, what I've done is I've said, okay, well, based on these ducts, these duct sizes, and let's see if I've got it here. Uh, yep. There's a little fancy tool that engineers created, and I've basically transposed this into the spreadsheet. Um, this is... Um, what's called a ductulator, and it allows me to optimize the airspeed inside of duct systems. So I've put all of that into this system, and um, essentially what it does is it helps people to choose the right fan, it cho they choose the right ducts, and they make sure that they've got a system that's gonna have the highest chance of success without getting a really expensive thermodynamic model. Um, so once you've got all that kind of set up, you've got your R value, you've got your glazing, you've got your shape, you've got your cross section, um, you've chosen your insulation materials. Now what we can do is we can calculate exactly how much we're going to have to put into this greenhouse for heat. And so I built another tool for that as well, which allows you to choose between propane, oil, gas, 
um, all the kind of primary fuels, electricity, and then you can choose a secondary fuel as well, which will be kind of wood. Um, and if you choose wood, then there's a, I don't know, probably a hundred different wood species in there with different BTU values. And you can opt for how much of your heat is going to come through fossil or kind of primary fuels versus secondary fuels. And then this will kick out what your annual heating bill is going to cost. I really recommend people take the time to uh, to do this. It's not that hard to do. You can, you know, there are great books on how to do this um, very inexpensively or easily. Um, Google is full of heat loss calculations that you can get for free. Um, if you don't want to go searching for that, though, um, we've kind of really made this simple in our design tool so that once you've kind of made all the decisions that we've talked about, this is the result of, um, uh, you know, all those decisions that you've previously made. And so now, you know, someone like Curtis could go and use this tool and basically say, well, I know that I need to budget $2,300 a year in heat. And then if you went back into the tool and said, well, I want to actually try using a thermal curtain at night, um, he'll actually be able to see the result uh, of what that thermal curtain is going to save him on an annualized basis. So you can use this for business planning. You can use this to see if you're going to be able to afford to, to keep this thing warm on your homestead. Um, it's good to quantify these things before you go and, and spend the money to build it. Um, so lastly, just before we go to questions here, um, I'm a really big fan of permaculture, obviously. My company name is Verge Permaculture. And one of the things that I love about permaculture is, is how it approaches integrated design. So this is one of our latest designs, or greenhouse designs. So it has a, a wood-fired hot tub. It has a subtropical food forest, um, greens production, a commercial canning kitchen, and a root cellar. And so the canning kitchen produces a lot of steam and heat as a result of cooking which then gets shuttled into the greenhouse. So the greenhouse needs heat. The commercial kitchen produces waste gases and heat. The um, root cellar um, actually is a, a net heat source in the winter and it's a net uh, cooling source in the, in the summertime. And so it made sense to couple the two. Plus when you're canning food in the kitchen, you wanna move it straight down into the root cellar. So it kind of made sense to combine those two together. Uh, and so I'm a really big fan of trying to uh, combine multiple systems into one because we get all sorts of benefits that we wouldn't necessarily get if we just built them independently. Um, and so one other little thing that, that I really enjoy um, in, in where, the way I design is I love kind of wherever thermodynamics and biology intersect. And so, um, and I think Neil's been experimenting with this in Saudi Arabia, and I'd love to actually have another conversation with Neil about earth tubes offline at some point. But um, me too. What, what's that? I'd love to have that conversation too. Awesome. Uh, so basically, we put pipes underground, and we will take the the excess thermal energy out of the air in the summertime, and pre cool it down and. This is a really important technology for the next coming decades because uh, The Guardian put out an article not that long ago saying that globally we're going to be using more cooling energy than heating energy. So cooling technology that's low tech and mostly passive like this is going to be super valuable in the future. Um, so all summer long, as we cool this summer air down, we're actually preheating the ground for the wintertime. Um, and so and then our really cold air in the wintertime is then going to be pre-warmed for at least a portion of the winter before it enters into our, into our root cellar. And then our root cellar will then take any excess stale air, um, which would be at four degrees Celsius or roughly 38 degrees Fahrenheit, and push it up into the greenhouse, which will allow this greenhouse to stay above zero um, in the extreme cold. So um, just quickly, I just wanted to go through kind of some of the top um, business opportunities that I see with passive solar greenhouses. So I'm getting a lot of requests for stock passive solar greenhouse uh, designs. So these are like pre-built designs um, that then can get purchased and, um, uh, and then sent off to a manufacturer that prefabricates these greenhouses and then puts it onto a flat deck truck and drives it out to site, plants it into the ground and away you go. Um, a lot of people want these things, but they don't necessarily want to pay for a custom design every time. And so I think that if you're a builder, I think that you could do really well with this especially in Canada as a lot of the, um, the grow up kind of uh, rules are changing up here. I'm getting a lot of calls from people that are have medic medicinal prescriptions and, and want to um, basically uh, legally grow some of their own medicine. Um, custom designer, I, I get 
I think two or three requests per week to do custom greenhouse designs. I, I can't take most of them. Um, and so that's only going up. Uh, microgreens production, as Curtis has talked about, integrated fungi production. So mushrooms actually produce CO2. Uh, they they um, consume or, or release CO2, they consume oxygen. And so they can actually become the CO2 source for your greenhouse instead of buying CO2 or burning propane, which is what most greenhouses do in order to try and increase production. So you can do a combination of microgreens and fungi production in one operation. Season extension for people that are in uh, really short seasons. And then there's the food security piece. Um, so there's there's all sorts of um, things that you can do with these. Um, so just before we go to Q&A, uh, we have a five-week intensive passive solar greenhouse course starting this Tuesday. Um, and basically, like I said at the beginning, you guys can probably sort most of this stuff out on your own. The information's out there. But uh, we guide people and fast track them to the end quicker uh, with our process, with our design tool, with our book, and with all of our content that Curtis and I have curated for you to basically cut through the noise and get straight to the signal so that you can get straight to building right away. Um, so the course includes the design tool, an ebook. It's actually a 10 week course that we've condensed down into five weeks. So you're going to get two modules per week plus a tailored webinar um, where you can come in and ask any question that you have about greenhouses for the five weeks that you're in the program. Uh, we have a limited time Facebook for that five weeks, so you're going to be able to find a, an accountability partner and post your designs up to Facebook, but that will be limited to the five-week program. Um, we have video case studies, so I've gone right across Western Canada. Curtis is one of them. Um, where we've documented the successes and failures of other passive solar greenhouses, so you can learn from them. Two sets of plans, including Curtis's new revised plans that I've just uh, co-built with him, um, as well as my uh, passive solar greenhouse root cellar and commercial kitchen, um, and uh, an actionable plan at the end. So you're going to be able to walk away from this and have all of the tools and information that you need to basically be able to go and do um, or build your own passive solar greenhouse if you stick with the program um, and do all the homework that we talk about. So um, if you're interested in that, I know that um, Neil and, uh, and Raleigh will be sending you more information on that at the end. Um, the primary outcomes, um, you know, people looking for a side hustle to help monetize their backyards. Uh, people that will benefit from this are, um, you know, wanting a way of growing a resilient, nutrient-dense food for cold, harsh climates. People that potentially are looking for year-round food production for vegetarians and vegans, urban farmer, farmers wanting um, to round out their income kind of around um, 12 months of the year, and people that want uh, a more resilient food production system. So um, I'll just leave this up here for a few minutes, guys, and we can open it up to Q&A, and I'll, I'll let Raleigh and Neil kind of uh, sort out uh, any questions coming in, and uh, hopefully I... I, I didn't give you too much to overwhelm you, but I gave you the kind of overall uh, process that you can follow and, and you can get this video again and, and make sure that uh, you've got an actionable process that you can use regardless of, of which path you take. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Man, I love the, those cooling tubes. I like that, the earth cooling. That's that's super cool. It, it just makes so much sense. It's, it's ridiculous why instead of air conditioning where people are spending – a disgusting amount of power why not just do that built into houses um, yeah we have, a, we have a house that we just put in uh we have a 400 foot uh inch and a quarter poly pipe that's filled with glycol uh and it does all of our cooling and preheating for the winter with a, an eight watt pump so just to kind of wrap your head around that uh every unit of energy we put in we get 28 units out uh, the average air conditioner moves three units of heat for every unit in. So this thing uses less energy and it's more effective, um, but it has to be incorporated with the right design on the other end. Yeah. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, if you got questions, now's the time to ask them. Just put it in, in the chat box down below. Uh, some of you had questions earlier, but it, it's good to re-ask. So plop them down below in the questions and we'll get to them. And if Gabrielle. we really got time, all right, Gabrielle's questions. Okay, uh, Gabrielle's coming in from, Gabrielle, you're in Spain, right? Uh, Gabrielle's saying, France, yeah. 
She says, in Western Europe, where late fall and early spring can be hovering around minus 10 Celsius to plus 10 Celsius, would a passive greenhouse still have the low level vents? Or would you design it in such a way that you could close the lower ones at night? So your vents are always going to be operable. And um, we, we generally set them up either using a control system that will run off of a small stepper motor or, or motor itself, or ideally we'll use um, uh, an opener that uses an expanding medium like wax. And so when the wax warms up, it will automatically open those windows. And um, there's plenty of different, I think Univent is the, the, the brand that I've used. Um, and you can actually set the vent uh, cylinder to um, specific temperatures. So it'll open at a specific temperature, it'll close at a specific temperature. So it, even in uh, a milder climate like the one you're describing, you still want to have, you're still going to get overheating issues. You're still going to want operable um, upper and lower vents. Awesome. So here's no one from Ken asking, what are your views on geothermal in-ground greenhouses like the Wapini? I have a valley with a south-facing hill in southern Ontario that would be perfect. Um, are there extreme humidity concerns, etc.? So I have a, a blog that I wrote. It's pretty short. It's called Rob's Modified Walpini. And uh, it was a response to um, uh, some frustration that I was having with all these shares that were going around about the Walpini. So um, the Walpini is supposed to be this really inexpensive um, um, greenhouse that... Uh, uh, is dug into the earth. It's basically a dugout, essentially, with uh, trusses that go over top of it. And it can be a good option for you, but uh, more often than not, I find that they're not necessarily a great uh, greenhouse option for folks. So a couple of things to watch out for if you're going to do that. In southern Ontario, you guys have a lot of really, uh, like the groundwater is really high there. And so if you start digging a hole in the ground uh, and you do have high groundwater, it's going to turn into a pond, which might be a great opportunity. Um, but if you want a greenhouse, it's not necessarily going to be what you're going after. Number two, the minute you dig a hole in the ground, um, it, at least, I mean, this is from my oil and gas days, uh, you're basically working in a confined and dangerous space because um, the walls can essentially collapse in on you. So to do it properly and make sure that you're not going to die, um, you need to put uh, proper retaining walls in. And by the time you do that, you're either going to be using uh, pounded tires, which takes an enormous amount of effort. I think Michael Reynolds from the Earth or Garbage Warrior says eight tires per person per day. Um, and the average Earth ship, which is basically what we're building here, is, you know, 1,500 tires. So you can do the math on that, 1,500 divided by eight. Um, and so by the time you put a retaining wall in there, you haven't really gained anything. And then the advantage of the geothermal becomes a disadvantage because now your greenhouse might never go above, you know, at the ground level, eight or nine degrees Celsius, where plants, plants prefer to be in the 15 to 23 degrees Celsius range where they're kind of optimally photosynthesizing. So I think you're better off to generally go above grade, as we've talked about, uh, unless you have very specific circumstances where you've got uh, groundwater tables that are suitable. The last thing I'll say about it, um, do some research on radon. Radon is now the leading cause of lung cancer because most people are not smoking anymore. Um, and so you could be subjecting yourself to a bunch of radon as well. So just do your homework on that. Oh, Curtis, your, your mic, mic is off. I think the... Uh... Wallapini thing is silly, frankly. Rob's has a nicer and more uh, educated way of putting it, but to dig underground to build those greenhouses, the, that whole thing went viral, and it's just it doesn't make any sense. It might make sense in the tropics, but uh, I can't see any reason to do that kind of thing. The problem with the Wallapini that that Rob didn't really speak to uh, is that if you're underground like it is, what happens in the winter? In, nor in the northern hemisphere. The sun goes down in the sky, and that means you have long shadows. So you lose a massive amount of solar gain by that. So going underground doesn't make any sense for a greenhouse. It it it's completely counterintuitive. It's funny how think why things go viral sometimes. I, get I, I, can't ex I can't understand it, but in my opinion, that greenhouse makes no practical sense whatsoever. Yeah, I agree. Chris, I had a question. Uh, and some of the things that you grow in your greenhouse, has the, 
has there been any events that have wiped out, you know, your your plants growing outdoor but because your greenhouse you were able to save it? Uh, well, we don't. Yes and no. I mean, we don't do field crops in that greenhouse, so it's a different context. Um, so no, because I don't I don't grow lettuce mix in that greenhouse. I might grow it in the nerd like as a start, and then transplant it in the field. Um, no, but however, that greenhouse is extremely resilient to cold. Like we've had some gnarly cold winters. Our winters have been progressively getting colder for the last four years. And this year was no exception. This year was probably worse at the beginning than, than it was last year and the year before that and the year before that. So the fact that I can have an environment that's a stable 25 degrees Celsius or, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit all winter, regardless of the amount of light and cloud cover that I have um, is incredible. And, and that's, it's given, it's given us so much stability on the farm because it just comes down to cash flow. It means that my farm, no matter what, can make at least a thousand dollars a week with, you know, one person working part time. That's, that's all it requires to generate that kind of revenue in that greenhouse. So it's, it's, it's been critical for our business. Nice man. That's what's up. Okay. Ken's asking, I have a 15 year old polycarbonate greenhouse. I want to put up after your comments. After your comments on poly, would you bother with old opaque panels? Um, I mean, I think the easiest thing you can do, Ken, is to if you can if you've got some of those spare panels kicking around before you take the time to build the greenhouse uh, or re erect it, um, just uh, build yourself get some straw bales or or build yourself a little temporary small greenhouse and uh, put a tomato seedling underneath it and see how it responds. If the tomato seedling is vigorous, um, if you want to be more scientific, I'll give you a scientific approach too. But that means you're probably getting enough light through for it to still function. Um, the more scientific approach to it would be to go to your local hydroponic grow store and get a PAR meter. Um, they're two to 300 bucks. You can get them on Amazon too, PAR, photo, photosynthetic active radiation. And um, you can ask your friendly hydro grow store guy. I don't know why they're always so friendly. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Uh, but no matter where I go, they're always friendly. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, they'll sell you a par meter. They'll tell you how much par you need, and then you can test it. Under, like, so test the par underneath the glazing and see if it's still suitable. All right, cool. Here's one from Patricia. It's a pretty simple question. It's, uh, can you write down the APP name, please? Uh, app name. Uh, right, so that's, uh, I'll just look it up. So for Android, it's called Sunseeker, I believe, Sun Surveyor. Oh, okay. All right, hopefully, Patricia, that's what you were asking for. All oh, right, looks like that. looks like we rolled through a lot of the written questions. Wow, this is pretty, pretty quick. Usually we got like a library of questions, but it sounds like you were so in-depth that you don't need to answer any questions. But what we could do since we got a bit of extra time is – we can open it up to a live call-in, so if folks have a question, we can unmute their microphone, and uh, they can call in. So I got a question. Neil's got a question. Here we go. You think you could do a passive greenhouse in a place like Antarctica? Ooh, there we go. Because no. like yeah. it depends so much on this fluctuation of hot and cold over the seasons, right? But what if what if you're dealing in a place that's got stasis? Yeah, I don't know. I, I to be honest, I have not studied the Antarctic climate very much, so I'd have to look at it. Do you, what can you give me a couple of characteristics of it? Um, like what's the day length? Day length is six months. Right. So it's twenty. <laughs> is it like the northwest, the North Pole, where you've got 24 hour sun for half the year and no sun for the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then I think that, I mean, I just, I just was dealing with, um, um, the Northwest territories, uh, group of people that wanted to put up a greenhouse. And I think the trick there is you do season extension. So, you know, and, and I, I've just done a YouTube series on this. I think that, um, it's a complete, uh, without getting too much into physics, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to try and force the global population onto one type of a diet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so looking at the traditional diets up there, we can say, well, you know, it, it might make sense to have some greens because you guys have become acclimatized to them now through, you know, the Western culture, I guess. But um, expecting to be able to just grow year round. I mean, a lot of these communities in a- Antarctic would be the same, rely on uh, diesel gensets running 24 um, seven. Yeah. And so I have this kind of theory that I'm working on, um, which is um, that sustainable food actually has to be uh, contributing to a reduction in overall entropy. And, um, and so that would be the first kind of question that you and I would probably have. A, I think Bill Mollison said, teach someone to garden and they become a philosopher. Um, and so that would be the first uh, thing that I would, I would want to look at is like, what's the energy balance? And uh, does that actually make sense from a sustainability perspective? And then, and then go from there. Cool. I'm curious, like, where is the most demand for passive solid greenhouses? Is it in like cold climates where Alaska, where there's just, there's extremely hard to do year-round food production? Or is it like the super hot places like Arizona or, you know, like it's a place both. like Neil in Saudi Arabia? It's both. Yeah, you know, I think like passive solar greenhouses, I think would take a different shape in Saudi Arabia. Um they would be shade houses. I, I would, instead of putting on glazing, I would use like a perspex or something like that. Mm-hmm. And we could actually kind of pull the the pedal off the gas um, or the foot off the gas pedal a little bit um, and use very similar principles. And I, I mean, there'd be other things to think about and we may not even need a passive shape there, but you know, there still would be a, uh, a, a reason to have a structure in Saudi Arabia to reduce its, in a, in a way, like what we're doing with a greenhouse is we're modifying the climate. And so um, we're always managing water and light, essentially. And uh, in our northern, sorry, water, light and heat. Um, and so in our northern climate, you know, our weak link is not enough heat. We've got lots of light um, yeah. and our water cycle is generally pretty good. And so Neil, on the other hand, is managing his water cycle by reducing or in the greenhouse type structure, he'd reduce the water demand by derating the sun um using some some sort of a similar concept so it's just a climate modification mechanism yeah and the heat is the trickiest part where i am right yeah, you right. can't get out of it i bet I, wait neil have you guys done anything like that where it's it's the the air cooled under the earth and then it we um we started building something that we haven't completed yet um which is a uh, it's just a modified traditional Tunisian home. Hmm. Um, if you've seen the first Star Wars movie that came out, which is a, number four, Luke's got this like house that's under the. Yeah. It's got a courtyard with rooms coming off of that. So I'm building one of those. Uh, um, cool. But then we we're pursuing a contract to manage all of Mecca's wastewater. Wow. Um, which is about 100,000 cubic meters a day. Um, <laughs> That's so on crazy. When it's not Hudge. When it's Hudge, it goes up to 500,000 cubic meters a day for a month. Um, and so we're looking at, since that is treated wastewater, we can't use it for agriculture, not because it's not potable, but because of uh, cultural issues. So we're actually looking at doing a sprouted barley operation with this water, and then we can supplant all of the imported hay and barley from Australia and completely replace that with stuff grown off of the wastewater here. Have you seen? Um, I think that's so you know so self-evident. It's crazy. What was that, yeah. Rob? Have you seen what the effluent looks like on the back end of the barley? No. I have some uh, papers that that we should talk about afterwards. Yes, we should because we're we're uh, evaluating companies. My boss wants to do it all robotic. Like she wants it to be as automated as possible. Hmm. Um, it's just a question of how much filtering do we need to do from the treatment plant to our facility, and then are there going to be issues with stuff we can't filter out? Um, and then after that, it's just 
does does this see and this is where we're talking about cooling because water is obviously not going to be an issue here in fact we could use water to cool a place which is what they tend to do in desert greenhouses um they set up these giant cardboard walls that have water trickling down on them and then they blow massive fans through them that's how they tend to cool greenhouses here mm -hmm. which is not a great use of water right they go through a ton of water to do that but water won't be our weak point if we have you know 10 million liters of water a day yeah. that we have access to yeah and so the the question of what that facility looks like in terms of where do we build it do we put any of it underground um and designing the inflows and the outflows of that is something we're looking at right now we have a commitment from the ministry of water that uh within the next two years they will uh fund 75 percent of this operation um so it's just a question of getting the design right and um, the legalities of it. Right. And you got biomass. The, the, the short answer is yes, We I am pursuing this stuff. Nice. But it's, uh, it's been in the works a long time and it's still there's still a lot more to happen. Mm. Cool. All right, folks. Uh, so this is the last chance if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with Rob and Curtis, just, just let us know, type down below if you have a microphone hooked up and then we can unmute your mic, just type in the chat box. Otherwise we can just close this out and just remind I, you, uh, what's that Neil? I just want to say thank you to everyone. We had 50 people yeah. here. I think that was pretty cool. Thanks Rob. I love how technical you get and how thorough it is. Really fantastic stuff. Thanks to you too, Curtis. I love that you're living it and that you could show people what it looks like when, when it's not just uh, good images and numbers on a spreadsheet. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, Curtis, Thank I got to say one thing. You're, I'm reading this book, The Wizard and the Prophet. You're kind of like the James Borlaug of, of the urban space, man. You're like, you're increasing the carrying capacity of what can be done in cities. And Rob, you're, you're part of that awesome push too. And I think that's so cool where I think you can't grow in a small space, but you're like, oh yeah, let me show you what you can do. Nice. Change the game. Um, so yeah, everybody. Well, uh, just remind you one more time, they've got the passive solar greenhouse course that's up there. When's the enrollment end? Uh, is it end Sunday night? Sunday night. All right, night. Sunday night. So if you're interested in that, there is the link below just in the chat box. That's uh, the... So just click that link. We'll send it to you in the replay. We'll send this replay to you free for everybody. And we'll remind you right before that ends. And I think without further ado, that might be it. So thanks, thanks guys. everybody. Appreciate your time. And thank you, Rob and Curtis, for joining us. Man, I, I, it's always a pleasure to – I'm grateful to taking the time out of your day to, to come join and present to our audience. It's awesome. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Bye, All right. Well, everybody have an awesome day. Enjoy the spring up there or the summer. All right. Peace.